All right, so we're going to do a predictor B update. I guess the thing too, so just to, just to put it, so addressing John's one, so if anyone hasn't heard of predictor B, it's a DNA-based test. So you take uh, soil samples, small cores to try and get a spatial distribution, goes off to South Australian Department of Ag, SARDI, they extract the total DNA, they've got uh, you know, selective probes that then can pick up the different pathogens and that's calibrated by the rate of increase of that DNA as to how much of the target DNA, so how much of the pathogen was there in the first place. Now we've gone out on a bit of a limb, we've discussed this a fair bit as a group and we're actually going to present to you the work we've been doing and then really trying to explain the concepts behind it. It's up to you guys as agronomists how you use this test. And if you actually look on a predictor B test, you've got the option here to actually tick what your sampling depth is. I'm going to cover sampling depth. So you won't particularly here say you've got to go 30, you've got to go 15, but you'll see some data on, on what implication has. The other thing you can tick where you actually took it, between rows or within rows, and the other one is whether you added stubble. Okay, so hopefully most people have done, have done the course that they're using this, and for others if you're going to do it, you actually hopefully think about this enough. You can make your own decisions how you want to use this test. It is a tool. It is just a rapid selective tool for figuring these things out. There's nothing fancy or magical about it. The other thing to point out too, so we've heard Brendan talk about nematodes, this is the only way commercially you can get your paddocks tested for nematodes now. Okay, the, the Queensland manual count test is no longer available, so this is the only way you do it. And I guess what that led us to is, well, if Predictor B was always driven in the north by nematodes, but if we can actually adapt that and get a better answer on our crown rot, then for the same price, you don't get any cheaper if you don't do your crown rot. For the same price, how do we get a more reliable crown rot number? And I'm not presenting this talk, but the other one that I think we're going to see a bit of is bipolaris, common root rot coming in. Particularly as we chase moisture and deep sow, we lengthen our subcraninode, so we, we lengthen our coleoptile length, which becomes our subcraninode. We're starting to see problems commercially with bipolaris there. Okay, so the beauty and why I'm passionate about it, we've been using it research since 2009, is you can get a measure of everything. So no point knowing I've got a crown rot problem, and I'll deal with that, but I've got a massive underlying Pratolankus thornia problem and you haven't tested for it. So it's a way to potentially uh, get everything. And we'll go through uh, with John, no doubt, about the, the ups and downs of both. So where to come out of, okay? So we did a survey, 2010, 2012, 307 uh, paddocks. We've seen the nematode data. This is just comparing a predictor B at sowing with the measured level of crown rot infection at harvest. Okay, and this is just the level of infection. So we call a, low, a nil infection, 0 to 2%. Low level infection, 3 to 10% of the plants are infected with the crown rot fungus. Medium, 11 to 24. And above 25% of plants, we call a high infection with crown rot. So you've got a high potential for yield loss. We can't, predictor B is never going to tell you what yield loss you're going to get in the paddock. Can only ever predict the number of plants that get infected. The yield loss is a factor of the number of plants that get infected in the end of the season. The fewer the plants, the less the yield loss. You can still have 100% of plants infected. You don't get the, the tough conditions, you'll be right. Just here, this is the predictor B levels below detection. On a log scale, above two, we call a high. Out of the 370, you can see a lot of them line up. And then 72%, I think, of the time, 78%, sorry, it was in within one category. The concern when you originally did this, these ones highlighted in red, we had 22% of paddocks where predictor B said we're lower below detection. But when we played it, 25%, you know, or 11 to 25% or more of the plants were actually infected with crown rot. Okay, and that's what we've been trying to overcome through this project with, with Alan Mackay at Sardi. Okay, so the first thing we went through, well, is it a detection issue? Is the, the probes that are in that uh, test, and there's three probes that pick up the variants in, in crown rot at the moment, is, is it not detecting? That's why. We can put that to bed. 800 isolates nationally, a fusarium come off symptomatic plants. There's no variant of the crown rot fungus out there that is not being detected by the current probes. Okay, so it's not a detection issue. So then it comes back to, well, is it a sampling issue? And we certainly had indications through the survey. We tend to find these paddocks where we under, underestimated was after a wet summer, and I'll go into that too. Okay, and we'll talk about this stubble spiking. So stubble spiking is adding bits of stubble out of the paddock into your soil test. Okay, a little complicated here. What we've got along the bottom is the log fusarium DNA number at sowing, so this is punching the cores across paddocks. 21 sites, 2013. We've got more sites this year, we just haven't played it out all the harvest samples. And this is actual level of infection again, measured at harvest. So pulling stubble at harvest, what percentage of plants got infected with crown fungal fungus. You can see there's a pretty good relationship uh, up here. 
When we put in our risk category, so a, a low risk level is before, below 1.4 on the log scale, you can see these ones down here, it predicted that we had a low risk on DNA, we developed under 10% of plants infected. We actually call these ones in here, so it was under 1.4, but we ended up with what, nearly 20, up to 60% of plants infected. We call this a failure to warn. So the test has given us the wrong, wrong answer, okay? This is where we haven't spiked with stubble. These are just soil tests taken on the row. We jump into the medium risk category, which is set at two. You can see it's actually defined these ones. We end up with around that 24% of plants or, or um, more infected. These ones we've under, underestimated again. Once we get into the high, so above that two, yeah, we get high infection levels. So it's fine at that stage. What the red ones are here, which are a bit, bit bigger, is where we actually had stubble at that site we could spike the soil test. So Predictor B is a soil based test and it's trying to pick up a stubble borne pathogen. So there's issues around that. This is where we put set bits of stubble in with the soil test and we sent them off. Where these arrows go to is where the log DNA goes to. And you can see where we could spike with these ones we've actually pushed it into. So it would have been into a, a medium risk category. We've got medium level of infection and it pushed these across into it where they were. Up this one which was already high, 4.3 on a log scale is just off the, the radar so it doesn't matter. Okay, so what that spiking does, we couldn't get stubble at these other ones to spike, it just wasn't visible. But where we can, got the ability to spike, we actually reduce these failures to warn. Okay, so we correct the test where it may underestimate it. However, down at the bottom, we've got these two ones. We actually end up with low levels of infection, but we've pushed them where we would have said that was a moderate risk and a high risk. Okay, so that's a false warning or a, 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 a false positive. This has been done nationally last year across about 196 NVT sites. So every NVT site got done. They were done on a sampling paddy protocol, sampling on row, between row, and plus or minus stubble spiking. And we've got all those samples just finished plating, I think 196 sites, as to what the levels of infection are. So this will be national out of the 2014 data. But pretty quickly from our stuff, it's not going to be too different. Spiking with stubble. So if you add bits of stubble in, it's going to reduce our failures to warn. Okay, we're going to err on the side of caution but it's also going to increase our false positives. Okay, that's the downside of it. Why does that happen? Okay, it really comes back to, for us in the north, I can't see us getting away from stubble spiking. So if you look what happens over, say, a summer fallow, or equally a break crop, you've still got that, that fallow period in there. Okay, if we have a dry summer, or a dry, you know, poor old Brad out at Walgett. So if you had a dry conditions, this is the crown knot fungus, it's in the crown, it's also up the stem, but generally it's concentrated in the base. So when we've got a dry summer fallow, we get pretty similar recovery. So if we've got 50% of the above ground stubble we can isolate the crown rot fungus from, we'll get a pretty similar number for below ground in the crown, because there's been no decomposition. But what happens in a wet summer, and this is a real number, this has come in um, uh, from, from near Tamworth. What we happen in a wet summer is we're actually getting decomposition of the crown tissue. Okay, so below ground, we get wet with that rain, there's more microbial activity, it stays wetter for longer, you get that decomposition process happening, the crown becomes a carbon source, other things feed on it and displace the crown up fungus. So we've lost our colour. But above ground, if you've got a standing stubble situation, it dries fairly quickly and your decomposition is really restricted. And this is a real number, so when we plated it, we plated from the crown and we plated from uh, a section above the crown, five to, centi five to six centimetres above the soil surface, up the stems. We only had 12% recovery in the, the crown and 70% recovery from the stem. Okay, these are real numbers and there's a fair few of these coming in. We've had a bit more rainfall. Okay, crowns break down quicker than standing stubble. If you give it moisture, you're always going to get quicker breakdown here than you are in standing stubble. Predictor B, if you just do a soil test, gives very good detection of crown levels. So it'll pick this up if it hasn't broken down, but it's going to pick this up if it is broken down. Still going to see some's there but it's going to underestimate. Spiking is going to give you a better detection of the above ground stubble levels. Okay, there's, that's the, the simple logistics of it. And I think in situations with us, it's going to be very hard to get away from, with our summer rainfall, if we're lucky enough to get it, this is going to happen more often than not. You go back through the CAS plating, it's pretty consistent when we get that, we'll get this differential survival below and above ground. And okay, and I'm really adverse to saying, well, we'll only spike with stubble when we have a wet, wet summer. What's a wet summer? How many mills? Yeah, it's, it gets a bit complicated. The other thing we're interested in is sampling depth. So this is uh, 24 sites 2013, 29 sites 2014. We actually did the six ranges in our own trials and MVT trials. 
And what we're looking at is, is, is a sampling strategy at a commercial level. So taking a 0 to 15 sample versus a 0 to 30 sample. So we had people tracking along doing the 0 to 15, people taking separate course, they weren't going in the same hole taking a 0 to 30. Okay, all of our stuff was targeted on the previous row. We did have, do a little bit, you see here, on between row and on row sampling, only with uh, 0 to 15 centimetre samples. So this was to be in line with the, the national stuff. With all of our stuff, we did the full predictor B test, but we won't go through every pathogen and we'll be here all day. Very quickly, so the main reason we're interested in predictor B is for Prolancus thornii, which is our dominant one, for our nematodes. So we're looking at our, our populations in grams uh, per, per, per gram of soil, sorry. 0 to 15 centimetres on the bottom, the number with the same sample at site, 0 to 30. 301 comparisons we got. Pretty good uh, R squared, so 80% correlation. And you can see the sum that pull away. So here's the one to one line. If it gave us the exactly same number with a 0 to 15 to a 0 to 30, then we get the same thing. So you've got inherent variability here. You'll see a few fall outside the, the thing. But when you look at it at the grower level of those risk categories, this is our actual um, risk level. So below detection, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 2 is low, and 2 to 15 medium. You can see here of the 301 comparisons, this is where the 0 to 15, the 0 to 30, didn't matter which depth you went, you got the same answer. So if 0 to 15 said it was a high risk, the 0 to 30 said it was a high risk as well. You've got a number of situations here, so only one situation where 0 to 15 would have been high, and the 0 to 30 would have diluted and said it was medium. So you can, we don't know for sure, but you could infer that there was a bit more of a concentration of the surface. Different here, it looks the other way around. But generally it's a wash up, 0 to 30 is giving us a bit, bit better. So 15 here versus 11, with a deeper giving us better in the, the low to medium. But when you look at these, they really float around those categories. You can jump over. So this might have jumped from 0.2 to 0.3, and it had to jump across into a next thing, okay? But the big wash up, it's at, at the grower level, doesn't make a lot of difference in terms of your risk category. Between an on-row does make a diff big difference. So the one-to-one -one line, you can see they're generally sitting this side. So they're saying that we're picking up higher numbers going on the row than going between the row. Okay, that's with zero to 15 centimetre sampling. We didn't do it for zero to 30. Okay, and that might be to do with the root profile, how they go down. So once we get zero to 30, it might, it might change. Okay, interfusarium. Okay, this is only 53 site comparisons. We had to remove the ones where we spike because spiking overrides everything. The second you spike with stubble, doesn't matter what depth you were or, or what, uh, whether you're on between row, it all picks up what's in the, in the DNA, in the, the stubble. Okay, 0 to 15, zero, whoops, zero, whoop. There we go, sorry, wrong one. 0 to 15, 0 to 30, you won't, you'll edit that out. <laughs> You see there, a bit of a tendency to be a bit more 0 to 15 on some of these, but not a lot pulling away from the one-to-one -one line. Again, when you look at risk categories, out of the 53, a lot of them are tracking exactly the same. They wouldn't have changed interpretation and a bit of a tendency to have more, um, you know, giving, giving a better level with the 0 to 15 and the 0 to 30, but, but as many jump the other way. So not a big difference there either. Again, not surprisingly, going on the row, up this side, high detection and a lot of them, you can see some here where on the row we're up, a, you know, in a very high risk category, so above the two is, is high risk. Quite a high risk here, but if we had it gone between the row, we would have missed it. It's, it's a stubble one pathogen, it's concentrated in the stubble rows. Okay, so the general wash up, 0 to 15 versus 0 to 30 centimetres doesn't make a lot of, lot of difference in terms of your risk categories for thorny eye. I guess the debate that we can have is if you go 0 to 15, because with the, the predictor B, they can only have half a kilo of soil, their test is calibrated to extract the total DNA from a maximum of 500 grams of soil, so therefore you restrict the number of cores. You go 0 to 15, you can do 30 cores across your site. You go 0 to 30, you restrict it to 15. And whether we're getting better spatial distribution, you know, if those nematodes are patchy by taking more cores. Certainly depth, not compromising other pathogens, so it's not, not that big an issue. Sampling on the row, if, if evident, if you can see your old serial rows, I'd certainly say target them. Um, you'll improve your detection of thorny, you'll also improve your detection of, of crown rot. But second, your, your stubble spike, you add stubble in there, serial stubble this is, not, not chickpea stubble or canola stubble, which some people did. If you add serial stubble in there, it overrides the depth and the row where you sample with crown rot. Okay, if you're taking 0 to 15, so you're actually taking 30 cores and it's one piece of stubble, one primary tiller, 
per site your core, so you end up with 13 bits of stubble in there. If you're doing 0 to 13, you only got 15 cores you're taking, then it's two pieces of stubble. So in essence, you're ending up with 30 pieces of stubble in there. We generally considered that a failure to warm with crown rot was a bigger issue than the false positives, and we can debate that. And the other one I just want to point out is beware of your sampling time in relation to any stubble management. Okay, we've had situations where people have taken their predictor B sample, come back, it was you know, on, the, on the border of, of low to medium, they've then gone and worked that paddock to, to get rid of wheel tracks. What they do is they've spread the inoculum then into the infection zone, evenly across the paddock, and they got smashed with crown rot. Your test has to be representative of what the crop's going to get presented with. And once you cultivate, you've mixed that inoculum that's in that standing stubble more evenly through the soil and into the infection zones, which are mainly below ground. Just to drive Rob stuff home, why do we want to want to err on the side of caution? Why do we want to test? This is actually 12 sites we had in 2014 from uh, central New South Wales up into southern Queensland. Range of varieties, no added crown rot. With crown rot, this is the, the average yields across site analysis. Okay, you can see varieties here, yielding quite well up this end. Gregory's set here. And this is the yield loss. So when we look at our yield loss difference between inoculated and unoculated, going from on average 27% in the Durham Caparoy, Lincoln's very susceptible, up to these other ones having lower yield loss. But as long he said, and, and um, certainly Phil pointed out too, it's the actual yield and the presence of disease is what we're after. And you can see when you start comparing to Gregory, so we set, set Gregory uh, here, you can see varieties, these ones here, more susceptible to crown rot. They're suffering on average across the 12 sites, 0.46 tonne yield penalty from growing Gregory if you're going to go Caparoy, 0.4 in Lincoln. And you've got these other ones, numbers not too different to Longies, you know. Suntop, in the presence of high crown rot, so these are inoculated plots, 0.58 tonne yield benefit over Gregory. So the key message here is, if you want to grow these susceptibles, and the same as Longy, we're not here to say don't grow Gregory, but if you want to grow those, you need to err on the side of caution. You need to know you've actually got a low risk. So if you core on the row and spike with stubble, you've, you've done the best you can uh, to reduce those, those failures to warn. It's certainly a bigger issue. And with Durham prices last year, I've got guys, and we're plating that stuff as well, wanting to go Durham on Durham. High risk. And we heard about risk this morning. Done. <laughs>